2 Timothy chapter 3, if you're there, would you say amen? Well, let's have prayer. We'll jump into this. Father, bless your word tonight, please. And again, teach us something from the Bible that I hope will help us. I know it will help us. It comes from the Bible. And the, and the Holy Spirit imparts us wisdom about it. It will especially help us. So please bless your word tonight as uh, we move through some other good words in our Bible. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Look at 2 Timothy chapter 3, and I want to just begin verse 13. And, of course, this is where we're at today, First, uh, 2 Timothy three thirteen. But evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. Now, I don't know about you, but just reading that verse, don't make it sound like stuff's going to get too much better as we get closer to the second coming of Jesus. Sounds like to me it's not going to get better. It sounds like to me it's going to get worse and worse. Am I right? Am I getting that from that verse there? Uh, so in the last days, evil men and seducers are going to get worse and worse. Now, I'm not suggesting that, uh, suggesting that we all just go into a deep depression and uh, just, you know, crawl in our cocoon and wait for the coming of Jesus. But let's just understand, you know, things are going to get bad. Be they're going to get worse before they get better. It's going to get darker before it gets lighter. And so we need to uh, understand that. Then look at verse 14, but continue thou. Paul says to Timothy, all right, now it's going to get bad, but what you need to do, what I need to do is continue thou in the things which thou hast learned and hast been assured of, knowing of whom thou hast learned them, and that from a child thou hast known, and then I like what he calls this, the Holy Scriptures. You know, the Bible is the Holy Word of God. The Holy Scriptures, which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. And then Paul said this, all Scripture is given by inspiration of God. And it's profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, mature, truly furnished unto all good works. Paul reminds us there in verse 16 that every word of God is inspired by God. The whole Bible is the word of God. I'm not just talking about the. Uh, I'm not just talking about the big words. I'm talking about the ands and the these and the thous, and, and the buts and the wherefores and the for. All of that. All the Bible is the Word of God. It is inspired by God. Not just the red letters over in the Gospel, the red words of Jesus over in the Gospel. I'm telling you, the whole Bible is inspired by God. I'm telling you, you can trust the whole Bible. I'm talking about from Genesis 1-1 to Revelation 22-21. We can trust our Bible. It is the Word of God. And with that being said, then you will recall that we've been going through some great words of the Bible. Great words. I'm calling it uh, Bible words that every child of God should know. And we're looking at some of the more prominent words that are found numerous times throughout the Bible that we as God's people ought to be familiar with, especially as we live out these last days. Now, I got this whole idea from Psalms 119 where the Hebrew alphabet is kind of broken down and used like an acrostic to give us that great chapter, longest chapter in the Bible regarding the Word of God. There are, there are 22, if I'm not mistaken, 22 sections to that psalm, and every one of those sections be begins with a different letter of the Hebrew alphabet. Well, I got to thinking about that, and man, how that we ought to use our English alphabet and kind of just go through some great words of the Bible that you and I ought to be familiar with, especially in these last days. So we've been just going through the alphabet, the English alphabet, just taking a letter at a time, looking at some words from the Bible. Last week, we were all the way down, I think it's the 20th letter of our alphabet, the letter T. And last week, we looked at four words in our Bible that begin with the letter T. We talked about the word Trinity. We talked about the word tithe. I could use T words without talking about tithe. We talked about the word tithe. We talked about the word tribulation. And then we talked about the word translation. All good words in our Bible that begin with the letter T. Now, this week, we're down to the 21st letter of our English alphabet or the letter U. All right? The letter U. Now, I got to tell you something right up front. There are no books in our Bible that begin with the letter U. Last week we had five books that begin with the letter T, all of them in the New Testament, but we have no books in our Bible that begin with the letter U. So, scratch that one off. And then we move to some prominent men. And I told you there's over 3,200 different men that are named in our Bible. 
But out of that 32 plus 100 men that are named in our Bible, only 19 of them begin, names begin with the letter U. Some of the more prominent men in our Bible whose name begins with the letter U is one old boy by the name of Uriah. Uriah. Now, I know you probably said, man, I, I don't know who that is. But there are actually six men in our Bible whose name was Uriah. My favorite one, uh, the story, I don't necessarily like him, but my, the favorite story around a man by the name of Uriah was the, the priest Uriah who uh, built an altar because he went down to Damascus and he saw an altar down there that was dedicated to a false god and he liked it so good he got the, dim he got the dimensions of it, come back to Israel and built, and built an altar in Israel to resemble the altar that was built to a false god. Uriah the priest did that. Well, I tell you what, there's a lot of people in our world today that are building altars in churches that resemble the world's altar. That's right. Uriah, he's a man in our Bible that begins with the letter U. And then there's an old boy in our Bible whose name is Uzzah. Uzzah. You remember Uzzah? Uzzah's the one who lost his life when he tried to keep the ark of God from falling off the wagon. Remember the story? David is bringing back the ark of God into the city of Jerusalem, and he's using Philistine methods to try to do the work of God. You know, David, David heard about the Philistines bringing the ark of God back into Israel on a cart drawn by two milk cows. So David gets him two milk cows, gets him a cart, and slides that ark up on it. And as the, as the, as the, as the, the cows are pulling the ark along, uh, the, the oxen stumble. The, the cart shakes. The ark tries to fall off. Uzzah reaches for it, slides it back up, and God killed him on the spot. You can't use Philistine methods to try to accomplish and do the work of God. Can't do it. Our churches, the churches today all over America are trying to use worldly efforts to reach people. And you just can't do that. God has, God has given us his word. And buddy, God won't step out of the confines of the four corners of the word of God if the whole world goes to hell. Maybe, I, maybe, I, maybe y'all didn't get that. God will not step outside of the perimeters of this book right here if the whole world goes to hell. God's given us his word. Uzzah, Uzzah was a good man but lost his life because David did try to do a right thing in a wrong way. Uzzah. Then we got another old boy in our Bible whose name is Uriah. Now Uriah is always called the Hittite. He was one of David's mighty men. And by the way, he was married to a woman by the name of Bathsheba. Now, does that kind of make that story a little more familiar to us? Remember how David had Uriah killed because David got his wife, committed adultery with his wife. She became expectant with David's baby, and so David, trying to cover up his sin, had one of his best soldiers killed. His name was Uriah. And then we have one more man in our Old Testament I want to call your attention to. His name was Uzziah. He was a king, the ninth king over the southern kingdom of Israel after the split, the ninth king, and he reigned for 52 years. And old Uzziah, Uzziah was a good king. But one day for some reason, in the latter years of his reign, he lost his mind. And he went down to the house of God and he tried to take over. Now we understand that God is a God in order and God has certain people to do certain things there's nobody that does all things outside of Jesus. God gifts people in different areas, and it's their job to do certain things in the house of God. But old Uzziah the king went down there and tried to take over. He went in there and tried to offer incense on an on a incense rod. And old Azariah the priest went in there behind him and said, Look, king, you're the king. You're not a priest. You can't do this. You get out from here. And, and, when, and when, when Azariah told him that, Uzziah reached his hand to grab a hold of the man of God and God smote him with leprosy, and he died a leper. Now, let me tell you something. The moral of that story is this. Stay in the place that God's given you as a child of God. Don't try to step over boundaries. Don't step over lines. Hey, listen, God's not called anybody to do everything. God's gifted people to do certain things. And I guess another moral of the story is keep your mouth and your hands off the man of God. Be careful. His name was Uzziah. And then there's only one man in our New Testament whose name begins with the letter U. Guarantee you, I know you've read his name, but guarantee you if I were to call his name and say, he's in the Bible. 
Here's his name. Look at this verse right here. Romans 16, verse 9. Salute Urbane. How would you like to be named Urbane? Salute, Paul said, salute Urbane. It's Romans 16, 9. And then Paul called him this, our helper in Christ. Must have been a good man. We don't know anything about it much. But Paul simply said, hey, tell, tell Urbane. Paul said, hello. Hey, tell him I appreciate the help that he is. In, in the house of God. And you know, that just reminds me of this. There's a lot of people in church who really we don't know. Maybe you don't know. There's a lot of people in church who never stand out in the forefront. Spotlight never shines on them. Maybe never get a shout out from the pulpit. But God's keeping a record, friend. God's keeping a record. And one day, when the record is called in heaven, they'll be recognized for what they did. Salute Urbane. Only man in the New Testament whose name begins with the letter U. Now let's talk about all the ladies in the Bible whose name begins with the letter U. All right, now having done all that, can I tell you this? There ain't no lady's name in the Bible that begins with the letter U. No ladies in the Bible whose name. In fact, I don't, know if, I don't even know if I can call a lady's name that begins with U. Is anybody in here Eula? That's not you, Eula. Who? Speak up. I can't hear. What are they saying? Ursula. Ursula. Okay. Whatever. And then as far as places go in the Bible, about the most prominent place in our Bible that begins with the letter U, one that you would be familiar with, would be a place by the name of us. You say us? Yeah. Remember this? Look at Job 1, verse 1. There was a man in the land of Uz, not Oz. That's where Dorothy and Toto was. There was a man in the land of Uz whose name was Job. Only place, or one of the most prominent places in all the Bible that began with the letter U. You know what I found out? I found out that most of the words in the Bible that began with the letter U are either the names of people or places. Shut up. But never fear. I have found some words that I want to share with you in this service tonight. So let's get started. First of all, great Bible words that begin with the letter U. Let's talk about this one right here. What about this one? Unity. Unity is a great Bible word. The word unity is only found five times in the Bible. It is something that God desperately desires for His people. But it's also something that Satan fears and works day and night to undo. Did you know Jesus actually prayed for the unity of God's people before he, uh, he went to the cross? You know, the one thing the Bible tells us that will convince the world that the church has something that the world doesn't have is when we love each other and have unity. Now, when I talk about unity, I want you to understand that I'm not talking about uniformity. There's a difference between unity and uniformity. Uniformity is when everybody's dressed alike. They look exactly alike. That's uniformity. Uh, there's no such thing in the church. There's some of us in here that's tall. Others of us are short. Uh, others are, are, are skinny and others are not so skinny. Some are pretty and some are... Uh, and, then, and then there's the rest of us. And, and, you know, we're all different. We're all different. Unity is not uniformity. Unity is not unanimity. It's not where everybody just sees everything eye to eye and everybody's on the same page and everybody always agrees with each other. That's unanimity. That's not, that's not unity. Let me tell you what unity is. Unity is simply when God's people have a oneness of heart, a singleness of purpose, and an agreement on the truth. That is unity. I'll tell you what Satan's desire is to defeat the church. But to, to defeat the church, one of the ways that he tries to do that is to divide and then conquer. Hey, can I tell you something? The devil is no match for a united church, no matter how large or how small that church may be. Uh, it doesn't matter. But if he can split us up, man, if he can get us to turn on one another, if he can bring us to the place that we no longer agree on the purpose and the and the and the and the, and the reason that our church exists. If he can do that, then he can stop our church. Satan's motive is division. Satan's method is deception. And Satan's mission is destruction. 
He wants to deceive us so that he can divide us in, uh, in, in reality to destroy us. Satan cannot defeat a united church because there's nowhere he can attack. Every plank is covered. Every side is protected. Even the gates of hell cannot prevail against a church that is united in the Lord Jesus Christ. Can't happen. But you let us get divided. You let us get splintered up. You let us get to choose up sides. You let all that happen. And friend, I'm here to tell you, we have given the devil place inside of our church. Unity. Unity is a great Bible word. You know something? I don't know if you... And I burn wood in some in the winter. Not as much as I used to, but uh, I, I burn wood. And to burn wood, you have to bust wood. And I don't have a wood buster. You know, some of y'all do, and that's good. But my wood buster is a maul. It's maul, that's what I used to call my mama, was maul. But a maul is not only a mama. A maul is a big old axe head. It's a big old, got a big handle on it, and it's a big old axe head. And sometimes when you cut wood, if it's green, it's easy to bust. And then as it dries out, it gets harder to bust. But uh, some people like, some pieces of wood like hickory are tougher to bust to me when they're green than when they dry out. Hickory wood is good wood to burn, wood to burn in the fireplace because it don't make a whole lot of ashes and it's got good heat in it. But to try and to bust that stuff when it's green, oh my goodness, it's like, it's tough. And about the only way I can get it busted when it's green is to drive a wedge in it. So what I do is I hit on it. I'll get me a, I'll get me a line started in it. Then I'll get my big old wedge. I've got a wedge. It's got a head on it about like that, and it's in a wedge. It's a piece of metal. And I'll start put that thing in there, and I'll start hammering on the other side with the, the maw, and I'll start hitting that wedge, driving that wedge down into that wood. And the first thing you know, you hear that old wood start popping. The deeper I can drive that wedge that wood begins to separate in the middle. And here's, here's what I found out. Once I get it busted in the middle, it's easy to bust the rest of it. It's that initial bust that's so hard. But once you get it busted, the rest of it's easy to bust. Once you get it divided, then it becomes easy to bust. You know, once the devil, the devil gets us divided... Our church becomes an evil prey, an, e an easy prey for the devil. You know, there's a verse, and I think I've got this one, Psalms 133. And I think, uh, verse, I don't know if I have verse number one or not, but I do know that I have verse number three in Psalms 133. And, and there's a verse that it goes something like this. Behold how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together. Say it with me now. In, not uniformity. Not unanimity, it's unity. Singleness of purpose, singleness of heart. Everybody's on the same page, understanding what our purpose is in this world. That's unity. And the Bible said how good and how pleasant it is for brethren. And by the way, I like the word behold. And that word behold simply means, hey, stop. Look and listen. Stop and watch this. And what he's saying is this. There is nothing more prettier in the world than a church that is in unity, a fellowship of believers that is in unity. What a sight to behold. There's nothing more beautiful in the world than a church that's all together under the banner of the Lord Jesus, under the authority, the umbrella of the Word of God. Did you know Jesus prayed for us to be unified together as believers? And right before he went to the cross, in John 17 in the Garden of Gethsemane, Jesus said this, Neither pray I for these alone, but for them also which shall believe on me through their word. And then verse 21 says, That they may all be what? One. Unity. That they may all be one, as thou, Father, art in me, and I in them, that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that thou hast sent me. You know what he's saying there? Hey, I want my church to be just like me and the Father are. We are one. I want my church to be as one. I'm telling you, there's no telling what could happen if we all get the vision of what the purpose of the church is moving forward in the same direction, but there's no telling what God could do in a place like that when there is unity. I heard about this old scientist one time. He was interested in dinosaurs. I don't know what you think about dinosaurs. I don't know. Somebody said, asked me one time if he, Noah had them on the ark. I said, I don't care as long as we don't got them in the backyard today. And, uh, but uh, dinosaurs, them things scare me. But uh, I heard about this old scientist one time, 
and he was crazy about dinosaurs, and somebody told him where they found a living dinosaur somewhere over in the continent of Africa. And so it was like one of these big tyrannosauruses or whatever. Now, this is not a true story. Just follow me. So, uh, so he goes over there, and he cuts through the bush. He finally gets back there to where they say that this dinosaur is, and when he gets back there, the dinosaur's laying on its side, its feet's up in the air, its tongue's hanging out of its mouth. It's dead. And there's a little old African standing there with a loincloth on. And, and the scientist looks at him and said, Did you kill that? He said, Yes, sir. How did you kill that? He said, With my club. He said, Man, how big's your club? He said, We got about 400 members. <laughs> Can I tell you something? Bless your heart. You let us get together in the club as God's people. You let the church get together and, man, and, and understand what our purpose is as, as the people of God and our function is as a church. And ladies and gentlemen, there is no telling what God might do through this church. I'm talking about unity. What a great, great Bible word. I'm going to get off of that one because I want to spend some time on this next one. This is a good one. Look at this one. The word unbelief. Unbelief. The word's found 25 times in the Bible, every time it's found is in the New Testament. Unbelief. What is unbelief? If somebody were to ask me to define or give a definition of what unbelief is, I'd just simply say this. It's a lack of trust. It is a lack of belief. How many of us in this room tonight are sitting in this room and we're filled with unbelief? Unbelief. We're like the lady that I heard about one time, and she lived in the shadow of this big mountain. And because she lived in the shadow of this mountain, it was always dark around her house, always dark. And, and she hated it, you know, moss growing everywhere and mold and mildew. And, and one night she's reading her Bible and she came across this verse right here, Matthew 17, 20. And it said this, If you have faith as a grain of mustard seed, you shall say unto this mountain, Remove hence to yonder, and it shall remove. Nothing shall be impossible to you. Man, she thought, Good night. All I got to do is have faith, ask God to move the mountain, and he'll do it. So that night, before she went to bed, she got down on her knees, and she asked God to move that mountain. She got right up the next morning, looked out the window. The mountain was still there, and she said, Hmm, just as I expected. You know, that's why we don't get more prayers answered. Because our attitude is, hmm, just as I expected. We pray and we ask God to do things, and yet in reality, deep down, we don't believe God's going to do them. We ask God to move in certain situations, and we pray that God will do it, but down deep on the inside, we doubt whether God will do it. You know what that's called? It's called unbelief. And it is amazing as you turn the pages of God's Word, as you go through the Bible, it's amazing what you find happened throughout the Word of God simply because people didn't trust God, simply because people did not believe God. Can I tell you this? On one occasion, two to three million people died because of unbelief. Now, let me tell you what I'm talking about. When the children of Israel had come out of the land of Egypt and they came to this place by the name of Kadesh Barnea, that was the place they were to cross over there and then start taking possession of the promised land. Well, Moses, being the good leader that he is, says, all right, before we go over there, let's do some reconnaissance. So he gets together 12 men known as the 12 spies. And he sent one man out of every tribe, and he sends these 12 spies out. They go over there, they sneak around, they look at things, and then they come back. They, they even take some evidences of what the land is like. They come back with some grapes on a staff. Between, the two men have kind of huge grapes. They come back, and they say, Moses, in front of all of Israel, all right, Moses, here's what we find. Man, it is exactly like God said it was. I'm telling you, the grapes are so big, we have to hang them off staffs. I'm telling you, it's a land that flows with milk and honey. It's abundant with natural resources. It's a great place to grow gardens. I'm telling you, it is a great land. But you know, God left out that part about them giants over there. Now remember, God is just taking care of them all the way from the time they left Egypt all the way till the time they reached Kadesh Barnea. God's taking care of them when they needed water. God caused water to come out of a rock. When they needed food, every morning when they woke up, there was manna laying around the camp, uh, the camp uh, of, of the nation of Israel. When they got thirsty or hungry for, uh, for meat, God caused by any sausages to come flying into the camp in the form of quails. I mean, man, everything they needed, God supplied it for them. Every war they fought, 
Man, as long as they were right with God, they couldn't lose. Nobody could beat them. God had been good to these people. God had taken care of every need that they had. And yet, when they got over there and they started talking about them giants, they wouldn't believe that God could do it. They turned back into the wilderness. And for the next 38 years of their life, two to three million people died because of unbelief. God told them to go. They said no because they wouldn't trust God. You know what that's called? Unbelief. I, there's another illustration of unbelief in our Bible. In Matthew chapter 17, we got the story of this man who's got a wayward boy. And let me tell you something. His boy was wayward on steroids. Uh, his boy was demon-possessed. I mean, man, he, he's constantly trying to kill himself. He's thrown himself into the fire. He's thrown himself into the water. He's trying to commit suicide. He probably looks terrible. He's foaming at the mouth. He's chewing on his, uh, his tongue. He's got blood and, and spit running out of his mouth. His face is deformed where he's thrown himself into the fire. His ears is melted, run down the side of his face. I'm telling you, that boy is a mess. And so that, man's, that boy's daddy brings that boy to the disciples. Jesus has given those disciples the ability to cast out demons. Matthew chapter 10, verse 8, he says to those disciples, heal the sick, cleanse the lepers, raise the dead, cast out devils, freely you've received, freely give. God gave those disciples, Jesus did, the ability to cast out demons. And yet when they brought that boy, to, when his dad brought him to those disciples, nothing happened. Matthew 17, verse 16 says this, I brought him to thy disciples, and they could not cure him. And here's the reason why. Look at this verse. And Jesus said unto them, because of your unbelief. It is amazing to me how much we could see God do if we just believed him. Unbelief. Here's my favorite one. Can I tell you this? Jesus has gone back to the, his hometown. His hometown, my hometown is Mount Airy. The hometown of the Lord Jesus was Nazareth. That's where he was brought up at as a boy. In fact, he stayed there probably till he was 30 years old. Then he switched his hometown from Nazareth to the city of Capernaum. But all those years he was there in the city of Nazareth. That was his hometown. And the Bible tells us on an occasion Jesus went back to his hometown. Now you would think, you would think, being the hometown of the Lord Jesus, when he got there, he would have received a hero's welcome. You would think they would open their arms, had a ticker tape parade. This past Monday, when I left the hospital, I was coming back to church, I stopped at Chick-fil-A. Not this one, but the one over near the hospital. And so uh, when I walked in, everybody standing there said, like that. And I said, what in the world? And they said, you're our first customer since we opened back up and are let people start eating inside. You know what I said? Where's the balloons? Where's the ticker tape? Hey, better yet, where's the free food? You would think when Jesus got back to his hometown, I mean, man, they gave him the key to the city, rode him around in a limousine, uh, buggy with two camel power engines. You would have think, man, they shot off fireworks. But when he went back to his hometown, here's the kind of welcome he received. Mark chapter 6, verse 5, and he could there do no mighty work. Save that he healed, uh, save that he laid his hands upon a few sick folks and healed them. Now, you would think if anybody would believe that Jesus was the Son of God and, and he could do anything, it would be that crowd at Nazareth. They'd watched him grow up for crying out loud. I mean, they, they'd heard about him. He was, he was, a, he was one of them. They, they, were, they were familiar with him. And yet when he got back there, the Bible said he was so limited in what he could do. All he could do was heal a few sick folks. Let me tell you why. Here's the verse that tells us why. And he did not many works there because of their unbelief. You know what? Our unbelief can stop the power of God. You know, I, I'm like you, but every Sunday morning I pray, oh God, meet with us. I'm just like you. I, oh God, help us. Lord, save uh, sinners this morning. Get a hold of hearts. Please don't, uh, please help everybody there, son, saved to get saved. God, help your people. God, send revival. And yet many times, just like you, I get up off my knees and say, hmm, he ain't gonna do that. And I wonder if my unbelief 
hinders what God can do for us because we don't believe Him. You've been praying for a lost loved one for years, but down deep in your heart, maybe you've never come to the place that you've just said to God, God, I believe you can do it. In a heart of faith, filled with faith, I believe you can do it, God. I'm trusting you. But how many of us pray and our attitude is, I'm going to ask you to do it, but I know you ain't. And we tie the hands of an almighty God. We limit what God can do for us because of our unbelief. I want to be like that old boy, that boy's daddy, when he said, Lord, I believe. Help thou mine unbelief. God, please help me. Have mercy on me, Lord. Help me to trust you. God, give me the faith. God, give me the ability to trust you. I'm begging you, God, do this. Marriages that need help. Oh, God, I beg you to do it. Down deep, I'm saying, I know you ain't going to do it. We're like that in Acts chapter 12 when they were praying for Peter to get out of prison. They were down there at John Mark's, uh, John Mark's mama's house, Mary. They were down there having prayer meeting. And uh, the Lord heard their prayer and answered their prayer and sent Peter down there. And when they got down there, they didn't believe it was Peter. They were in there asking God to do it. And when God do it, they didn't even believe it. Am I right? Aren't you glad sometimes God, in spite of our unbelief, does it anyway? But how many times do we tie the hands of an almighty God because we just don't believe Him, we don't trust Him, we don't have faith in Him like we should? The word unbelief. And by the way, can I tell you what the saddest thing about unbelief is? Look at this, Revelation 21, verse 8. Here's a list of people that are going to hell. And right at the top of the list, the Bible said, but the fearful and, what's the next word? Unbelieving. The fearful and um, shall have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. You know what the ultimate sin that carries a man to hell? I said this Sunday morning, people don't go to hell because they smoke, smoke weed. They don't go to hell because they cook meth. They don't go to hell because they look at bad magazines and dirty pictures. And they don't go to hell because they say cuss words and, and they buy lottery tickets and, and they drink alcohol. They don't go to hell. You know why they go to hell? Because they don't believe. They don't believe. Unbelief. What a Bible word. To think that a puny human being can stop God from doing what God wants to do because I don't believe him. Oh, my. Oh, my. Unbelief. Next word. Unity. Unbelief. What about this one? Unfeigned. You say, preacher, what does that mean? Well, it's only mentioned four times in the Bible. But in every case, it means the exact same thing. And it means this. To be sincere. Or it means to be without hypocrisy. Here's a good illustration of it. 1 Timothy 1, 5. Now the end of the commandment is charity or love out of a pure heart and of a good conscience and of a faith unfeigned. A faith that is, that is full of sincerity. A faith that is without hypocrisy. Oh, the need in these days is for us as God's people to be unfeigned. You know something? We ought to be the same way that at Walmart that we are at church. We ought to be the same way in our neighborhood that we are at church. We ought to be the same way inside the four walls of our house that we are at church. We ought to be unfeigned. We ought to be without hypocrisy. And y'all pray for me. I'm a work in progress. But I'll pray for y'all because y'all work in progress too. Because let's just be honest. There, there's sometimes we all say do this and we don't. And there's a lot of times we say, don't do that, and we do. I'm telling you, we need to be without hypocrisy. We need to have a faith that is sincere and without hypocrisy. Say that with me, unfeigned. A faith unfeigned. Remember what Paul told Timothy over in 2 Timothy chapter 1. You're there. Turn back to 2 Timothy chapter 1 for just a minute. You're just across the page there. Look at verse number 5. Paul said this, When I call to remembrance the unfeigned faith that is in thee. In other words, Timothy, you're the real deal. Timothy, there, there's nothing pretentious about it. You're not pretend. You're not a fake. You ever see these people that are fake? You work with some of them. 
they're deacons in churches or they're, they're Sunday school teachers and they cuss like sailors or they're preachers and they won't pay their bills and they, and they, and they, they cheat everybody in the community. Uh, we see that all the time and I'm telling you, it is destroy, it's killing the, uh, the testimony. Uh, we're one thing at church. We leave church, go right out, the, out here in the world, and you can't tell the difference in us. We need to be unfeigned, sincere without hypocrisy. Can I have an amen? amen. How many of y'all know somebody right now that's a hypocrite? I mean, you know them. Maybe they're in your family. Maybe you work with them every day. God, help us not to be like that. God, help us. Unfeigned. And then last of all, here's a good one. Save the best one for last. What about that word? Unction. You say, preacher, what is unction? Can I tell you this? I really don't know what it is, but I know what it ain't. I have preached enough to know when it ain't there. The word unction means anointing. It's only mentioned one time in the Bible, in 1 John 2, 20, where the Bible said we have an unction. We have an unction from the Holy One. We have an anointing from the Holy One. I'll tell you what, you can tell when a preacher is preaching with unction. Amen. Amen. You can tell it. You know, there's been two or three times in my life, only two or three, and I've been preaching since I was 18, and that's the reason I say pray for me. But there's been two or three times in my life when God put his hand on me while I was preaching. And buddy, I about went crazy trying to preach. It was unbelievable. I still remember those two or three times like it was like yesterday. There was a two or three times when God gave me unction. And I hope he gives me more than I think. I hope so. But I tell you what, it is hard to function without unction. Amen. It's hard. It's hard for y'all to teach without unction. You know, sometimes when I get up to preach, it's almost like I'm straining to find a word. I'm straining. I'm pulling it down. And it's maybe not y'all. Maybe it's just me. But, man, I'm really struggling. But then there are other times when you get up to preach, and it's like, man, God's just feeding it, feeding it in faster than you can, you can put it out. There's been some times I've got plumb deformed in the pulpit because it's coming in so fast and I'm trying to get it out. And I mean, I'm just come plumb bent out. Y'all know, y'all preachers know what I'm talking about. And God's shoveling it in so fast. I mean, I'm just, I'm almost just, I'm just deformed because I can't get it out fast enough. That's unction, friend. And I hope you'll pray for that. Hey, pray for your teacher when they stand to teach. They got unction, an anointing. Hey, pray for the preacher. You say, man, preacher, I tell you what, bless your heart. Man, it, you ain't doing too good. It's been rough, preacher. I tell you, why don't you pray for me? Pray for me because I need unction. Amen. Here's a little recipe and I'm done. When it comes to preaching, start low, go slow, rise higher, strike fire, sit down in the storm. There's been some times, you know, when I went to preach. You know, they used to call preachers from the floor. They don't do that much anymore because so many of us are crazy. And you can't, you can't trust them no more. So you don't call preachers. But there's been a few times that, you know, I've went somewhere to preach or whatever or didn't go to preach or whatever, but they call me from the floor. And, and here's the way you go. You, you start low. You go slow. You rise higher. You strike fire. And you sit down in the storm. Sit down with people saying, give us more, give us more. Not, not, you don't want to sit down when they're saying, oh God, are you not done yet? <laughs> Can I tell you the worst death in the world is to be preached to death. I went somewhere not long ago to preach. It was Sunday morning and, and, uh, and they'd already had two or three preachers. And they were, it was like homecoming. They were waiting to have a meal afterward. And I thought to the, the pastor that, that had asked me to come, I thought, Surely, surely don't get me up after all this. And he did. And you know what I said to them people? I said, the worst death in the world, the worst death you'll ever die is to be preached to death. I said, I'm going to give you a five-minute sermon and we're going to go eat. And you ought to saw them people come back to life when I said that. <laughs> Start low, go slow. 
rise higher, strike fire, sit down in a storm. You preachers ought to write that down, man. That's an original. That's what we need to do. Let's pray. Father, pray tonight.